Hi, everybody. Good morning. This is Caroline Hunter with the Ameristate Legal Plan. And I just want to thank you all for joining our myths and facts about estate planning. And at the very end, we are going to allow open discussion, live Q&A, which a lot of uh, webinars don't do. So I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, through, uh, we've got a couple poll questions that I'm going to be popping up throughout the webinar today. Uh, the first one will come up in just a second. So go ahead and, um, and answer those questions. As I mentioned, at the very end, we're going to have a live Q&A. So um, I will open up um, the Q&A to everybody. And you should be able to see that on your right hand, um, on the right side of your computer. There'll be a Q&A section. So you'll be able to uh, uh, put your questions in there. and We'll answer them. Um, most importantly, too, is when I start the presentation, um, you might want to adjust your computer to full screen so that you can see the presentation clearly. And there'll be a little button on the right hand bottom and you just click that button and that'll open it up to full screen. Um, but don't worry if you can't read anything. A couple days following the webinar, we're going to go ahead and send you um, a copy of this webinar. It'll include the presentation. And it will also include the workbook. And um, Michelle will talk about that workbook in just a second. But again, thank you. And um, I also would like to introduce Michelle and Greg. Uh, they are leaders here at Ameristate. And they will go ahead and they are going to uh, host the webinar, talk about all the um, myths and facts. So all right now I'm going to pop in the poll question. And then I'll be putting the workbook in. But I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Michelle. Great. Thank you so much for that intro, Caroline. I'm Michelle. I'm VP of Ameristate Legal Plan. We are celebrating, or we just celebrated, 25 years of protecting families and our clients with their estate plans. So congratulations, Greg, uh, for creating such an awesome company that we can reach out to Middle America and help 45,000 clients create their estate plans and protect their families. So thank you so much, Greg. Um, Ameristate is just an incredible company raised on family values and treating our clients the same. We have over 500 five-star reviews. And I just am just so thankful that our clients are happy with our service and they continue to refer clients throughout the years. And a lot of you here today are actually referrals of clients of ours. So thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to make sure that you all are aware of this great workbook that Caroline put together. You can um, print if you if you got this earlier on the email, you could have printed this out and you can actually handwrite your notes on this seminar or webinar, or it's actually, uh, you can type in it as well if you've downloaded it on your computer. This is gonna give you some great reference and also how to actually get started and a lot of good questions on how to get your own estate plan started. So with that said, we're gonna go right into, um, defining what an estate plan is. And Greg, can you jump right in there and let people know what exactly is an estate plan and what are the various types of things that a lot of people do to create an estate plan? Sure. Uh, thanks, Michelle. So, you know, simply put, you know, think of estate planning as, as sort of a roadmap for making sure your wishes are carried out when you pass away or you're unable to make decisions for yourself. An estate plan is really an umbrella term, if you will, to describe multiple different documents that help outline your health care wishes, how you'd like your assets and possessions distributed, and can even name who, do, who you would like to care for your children, your dependents, and even, yes, even your pets. Um, so besides making sure your assets get to the people that you choose, estate planning can help minimize uh, income, gift, and estate taxes as well. Without an estate plan, the laws in your state will determine what happens to your possessions, and the courts will decide who gets custody of your children. One of the main reasons we feel this is very important. We don't want to put a lifetime of what we've built, both in terms of family and in terms of assets, in the hands of the politicians or the courts or the state. So, Keep that in mind when we're thinking globally about um, 
what is an estate plan. Now, there are various options people think about in how to create an estate plan, because mostly we think about how do we get it from A to B, from me to you, right? Me to my spouse, me to my children, right? And there are various elements of estate planning, which are incomplete, um, as well as thinking about doing something that's more comprehensive. So let me give you some of the basic outlines of elements of estate planning, you know, most of which are not comprehensive. So the first element of estate planning, we call the do nothing plan or the state's plan, not the estate plan, the state's plan. The estate, you know, if you don't do any planning for yourself, you're not creating a will, you're not creating a trust, the state has created a plan for you. I'm sure you'd be thrilled to know what they have in mind for uh, for your lifetime of hard work and what, what they expect to do with it. Um, number two is having a last will and testament. A last will and testament is a good step, but like like most things, there's good, better, and best. You know, if you're selecting a vehicle, obviously there's there's variety of class of choices, good, better, and best. A will is good, but it's not necessarily the best. Uh, there is um, some people think about lifetime gifting, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, there's beneficiary designation. So sometimes we'll have assets that will allow us to name a direct beneficiary to that particular account, such as an IRA, or maybe a 401k, or maybe a life insurance policy. Um, we can do that right on the account agreement, and that can uh, determine who would receive that particular account or asset when we pass away. But again, it only applies to that one thing, so it's not very comprehensive. Um, there is lifetime gifting and joint tenancy. Um, Oftentimes, we encounter people that have, have done their own version of estate planning. I've got a home. That's the number one asset people think about. So, well, I, I only have one child or two child, two children or whatever. I want to ensure that my, my kids don't go through the legal entanglement of probate. So why don't I just add them on to title to my assets, put them on the bank account, put them on to title of the house, et cetera. That's adding a joint tenant to your to your assets. And that is kind of the most common thing people think about when they haven't really been educated or learned about proper estate planning, but that actually can cause more problems than it actually solves. So some of the dangers of, of joint tenancy are, you know, once you have added a child onto financial accounts or to real estate, by law, you have effectively given them half of those assets. They can take half or all of those assets without your permission, and there's nothing you could say about it. So if you don't trust them implicitly, those funds are considered to be their funds. What if it's real estate and maybe you want to downsize or sell or refinance? If you've added them to title, you're going to have to have their permission to be able to execute on whatever designs you have for your home. So maybe you want to refinance, maybe you want to sell. Maybe they don't want that to happen. They can they can basically stop it by not agreeing to, agreeing to cooperate with you. Uh, furthermore, uh, joint tenancy, when you add people to title of your assets, you're effectively giving them ownership rights, which means that if they have creditors or they go through a divorce, then, and think of a divorce as like, you know, your, your spouse you're divorcing is becomes a creditor, essentially. So think of it this way your children's creditors now can seek to attach your assets to satisfy their judgments. So joint tenancy can be a huge problem and there is a solution to that. There's better ways to do your estate planning. So, and then the finally, you know, in the good, better, best scenario, a revocable living trust can serve as the cornerstone and the foundation of your estate planning where you thoughtfully contemplate the distribution of your assets and possessions, thoughtfully contemplate who you want to put in charge of the administration or the settlement or the distribution aspects, who you want to name as guardians of minor children or disabled children or the like, and how pets and other dependents will be cared for and how your assets can be used for that purpose. So a living trust, uh, we feel in, in most situations, uh, is, is the best way to go. So that's a little bit about what is estate planning and um, what are some of the options that people consider. Michelle? Uh, great. Thank you, Greg. I think it's all good 
good to know because, uh, you know, I find that most people, what is it, 70% 70, 70 of people have the do nothing plan. Is that correct? That's that's still about right. We're trying to make a dent in that. But yeah. uh, we have 45 to 50,000 clients now. So we've helped protect those individuals and families. Right. But there's a lot more out there that haven't done any really formal planning. Yeah. And most people don't really understand. They don't know about it. They're not educated. So education is the key. A lot of people look at me like, what is an estate plan and why do I need a trust? And they just, uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, we still have so much more work to do to educating middle America or anybody, even the rich and famous don't have estate plans as you see, as you've seen in the news. So let's go on to the next, the very, well, not the next, but the first myth about estate planning. I don't need a living trust because I'm married and my spouse will get everything. That's so, that's such a typical myth I hear all the time. Well, I'm married. So if something happens to me, it all goes to my spouse. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and elaborate? Yeah, that that is a very common misconception. Now being married does, you know, does provide certain marital rights, you know, to assets and property. However, being married is not an estate plan. Um, a lot of variations can occur. You know, what if you have accounts just in your name and your spouse is not on the account? Uh, she wouldn't have access to those if you become incapacitated or if you pass away. Um, what if you're contemplating providing for the next generation, your children, grandchildren, et cetera, and you just figure, well, if something happens to me, my spouse will get everything. Well, number one, that may not be the case. Number two, it's a limited plan because what if you were to pass away in a common accident, you know, auto accident or something like that, where's the backup? Nobody else is on that account. So now you're going to be subjected to, uh, you know, the probate process and then uh, whether or not you have created a plan for distribution or not, you know, either your plan could be followed or the state's plan, which you may, may or may not like. So, um, you know, bottom line, just because you're married it doesn't guarantee that your surviving spouse is going to basically uh, inherit, receive, or have access or control over all of the marital assets. Just not necessarily so. And 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 that shouldn't be a question mark in your mind whether or not that is true or not. Michelle, I think you have a story that can kind of illustrate that. Right. You know, um, one of our clients who did their estate plan with us, um, both they both inherited money from their parents. You know, we're all a lot of us are inheriting money now, right? And we were thinking, oh, it's came from my mom, so I'm going to inherit that and just put it in my name. And then if something happens to me, it'll go to my husband. So I did find out that these clients had inherited money, put it just in their name, and the husband passed away. And all of a sudden, she's like, I can't get access to my husband's $600,000. Um, and it was in his name. I'm his wife. Shouldn't I just be able to call up and say, "My here's my husband's death certificate and get that money? That answer is no, because her husband did not put that into his living trust or their living trust. He could have kept it as a separate property, but he still needed to put it into the trust. It was just in his name without a beneficiary and he passed away. So what does that mean? That means that asset has to go through probate first. Okay. The good news is because they had a living trust, once that asset goes through this long process, a, a year, 18 months, process with attorney fees and probate and all the nightmares that go on with probate in each state, that money will eventually go to her. But what if he did not have an estate plan at all, or they had did not have a trust at all? They had nothing in place. Guess what? That $600,000 that she assumed would become hers when he passed will not happen because the state has a different plan for that money. And normally, or usually what we see happening is number one probate, about a year to 18 months or more. 
And then that money will probably end up getting in the hands of his children or their children together. And she'll get a little and they'll get a little. Well, what if the children are minors? What if the children are special needs? What if the children are even older? And actually, the wife should have received that. But no, the children get this money and the wife gets a little as well. So um, it's just fairly important to know that just because you're married doesn't mean your spouse is going to get your assets. And another point to that, Greg, is what if you're married and you have children from a prior marriage? You might not, you might want to set aside some money if you passed away that would go to your children from your prior marriage as well. So there's some other things to consider when, um, when you're married. So just to keep those things in mind. The next myth, Greg, um, myth number two is living trusts are only for the wealthy. Oh, does that mean they're that they're only for me? I mean, oh, oh, yeah, they're, they're only not for you, Greg. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I'm wealthy, but yeah, that is a that is a very common myth. And you know, we hear this a lot from other professional advisors too, which which means that you know, even professionals out there are not really grasping the importance of estate planning or when it's effective to do planning. So it's common sometimes that I hear even from financial advisors that, oh, you don't need a living trust because, you know, you you won't owe any estate taxes unless your estate is many millions of dollars, right? And so they conflate the need for estate planning with some high value of assets that you possess. And if you don't, you know, meet that threshold, you really don't need estate planning. That is one of the biggest myths that we face. For example, Estate, plax, estate taxes is one thing, and yes, they're not imposed on most of us because the threshold of assets we can leave to our heirs or family members, et cetera, is, is pretty large, so it doesn't really encompass most of us. Um, so estate taxes, which are the highest taxes in the land, by the way, you know, start at 40%, um, but most of us are not impacted by estate taxes. But what is important is keeping the extra expenses and time delays out of the equation. That's a process known as probate. As Michelle mentioned, you know, nine months to two years is a typical probate process where the court supervises, you know, your estate, uh, has appraisers crawling over everything, uh, valuing everything, uh, um, advertising for creditors. People can step in and make claims against your estate and the, and the, and your estate pays to hear those things out. Um, lawyers fees, court fees, appraisal fees, there's all kinds of stuff that, that happens that is needless. It doesn't have to happen. But one of the most important things to determine whether or not I would be sufficiently covered with a simple last will and testament versus a living trust is to look at the threshold where that court supervised probate process is gonna be stepping in. And in most states, the threshold for the court stepping in is about $50,000 in gross assets. If anybody owns a home in any state, I guarantee it's worth more than $50,000. I don't care if the bank you know, owns more of it than you do right now, it's still the gross value of the asset. California has one of the highest thresholds, but that threshold is only about $185,000. Again, you know, if you have total total assets worth at least that much gross value or more, and you don't have a plan, then the state is going to get involved through that probate process. So that's really the 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 marker or the line in the sand, if you will, as to when do I need a will, when do I need a trust? Because one of the most important benefits of uh, doing a living trust is avoiding the time and money associated with probate. Um, you know, you want your heirs to have access quickly and to be able to utilize uh, the resources that you intend for them and follow your instructions as quickly as possible without outside interference. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, um, let's take a simple example. Here's a probate cal calculator on our screen. Let's say you had a, you know, a modest estate of, let's say, $600,000. If your estate was subject to the probate process, 
you can expect about 8% in executor and attorney and court fees, et cetera, to occur, which is about 48, almost $50,000, right? That's money that your heirs are not going to get, and they're not going to see any of it for many, many months down the road. If you plan appropriately ahead of time, you might spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars. You know, some attorneys will charge you up to four or five thousand dollars, but but even if you were at the highest end of the spectrum, it's still a lot more economical for you to plan ahead than it is to to have your heirs lose, in this case, up to fifty thousand dollars in ex unnecessary expenses. You know, I call this the needless markup, right? So only for the wealthy, no. You'd be surprised. So it's, it's really not about how much you have. It's also what type of assets you have. So um, let's say uh, real estate. Your house is worth, well, right now, uh, you know, in, in California, we're looking at a minimum of $600,000 maybe for a condo and Really, the average now is about a million for a house, and um, and that's way under this the ex estate tax exemption, which is twelve thousand, about twelve thousand for a single individual, or twenty four thousand or so, a little bit more for a well, married I mean, the couple. Estate, the estate tax exemption is actually, you know, many, you know, it's like thir about thirteen million dollars you could leave, or twenty six if you're a married couple right now. Right. Right, it's gone to up avoid a lot. The estate tax. But the estate tax, as I said before, it doesn't affect most of us, so it's not really worth spending a lot of time on the estate taxes, but the probate's what's going to get you. That's what's right. going to get you. Right, you want to stay out of probate for sure. So myth, no myth number three, Greg, I am not old enough to, le to need a living trust and don't plan on dying anytime soon. I hear that a lot. Yeah, Tell that's a, that's a little another, bit more about that. That's another common misconception. And I want to tie it in part back to what I just said about probate. Because, you know, you could be a young person, maybe starting out in your career, and maybe you're just starting to accumulate assets. Maybe you don't even own a home yet, but you'd be surprised what you're worth, right? So there, there is financial and emotional um considerations here. So for example, we talked about the probate thresholds. You really don't want to subject your family to the delays and the costs associated with probate. And if you have a smaller modest estate, the percentage that probate is going to suck out of your estate is going to be higher, you know, in percentage than people with larger estates. So it's just going to, you know, take a lot of a lot of resources off the table for your heirs. But you know, again, in most states, if you own $50,000 worth of assets, that's a ticket to probate. California, higher threshold, about $185,000 in assets. But think about it in this way as well. Maybe you're single. Maybe, you know, your parents are going to be expected to deal with something if you should unexpectedly die before they do. Do you want to put that burden on them? And do you want the resources to be dwindled? so that they receive less. What if you're a single parent? And what if you have a minor child or a disabled child or a child uh, uh, tapping into the social safety net, SSI or SSD, for example? If you don't have a plan, they can't directly inherit. So therefore, there's going to be attorneys and courts overseeing every dollar spent on their behalf until they reach 18. What you'll typically find in that scenario is that most of your resources are going to go to fees and not directly to the care and support of your child. Um, and, and then they'll be inheriting at 18, which most of us, when we actually do plan, we want to be a little bit more conservative about giving over resources to our children until they're a little bit more mature, let's say through the college years or you know, on their way to a career, a little bit more responsible with their own resources. You know, what are most 18 year olds going to do if they get a fat inheritance, you know, out of the blue? Um, I can only I can only imagine what my kids would do, let alone what your kids would do. Right. So, 
you know, age is not the the defining factor. Uh, also, uh, if you think it, think of young people in their twenties, thirties, etc. You know, they they typically wander through the world at that age feeling invincible. Nothing can happen to them. You know, we can put this off until later. You know, that procrastination urge is is, is very strong because you know you feel invincible. But but we're not. You know, nobody nobody really knows how many how many days or years we have left on this on this marble. So, you know, think in terms of estate planning as protecting your resources and making sure that you don't create undue burden on other family members to settle your affairs through a court supervised process that gets dragged out and dragged out. Um, and if you have a minimum uh, amount of assets that would otherwise be subjected automatically to the probate process, you probably should have a, 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 a more detailed plan in place ahead of time. And you can modify it as things change over time. So age is not the consideration. Right. And, you know, the important thing is to get it done before something happens, right? Uh, it's kind of like buying life insurance or, or auto insurance or home insurance. This is state protection insurance because if something does happen to you you get in a car accident you pass away it's too late it is too late to do it and that's when the 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 attorneys start coming out and the vultures start coming out and the courts get involved and everybody who you've left behind or to care for you does not have the proper legal documentations to handle your affairs so thanks for sharing that uh as long as you are an adult, minimum age of 18, you need powers of attorney. As you get older, you're going to accumulate assets and families. You'll have minor children. You need an estate plan right then and there. If you have a business, you need an estate plan because that business will go through probate as well. So it's, it, as long as you're an adult, you need something. So just know that Call America State will help you figure that part out. Hey, these are this is my situation what is it that I'm look that I should be considering? Not everybody needs a living trust. Some people just need a pour over will with powers of attorney because they don't have those assets yet or the accumulation of assets or minor children or special needs children. So let's move on to the fourth myth, which is estate planning is only about distributing your assets after you're gone. Tell us about that, Greg. Yeah, that's a common misconception as well. So a properly designed estate plan has both living benefits for you and benefits for, you know, what happens to your stuff after you're, after you're gone. So, you know, especially when you're younger, you know, I think most people are concerned about the ability to control their own destiny, control their own affairs, make their own decisions, right? That That is paramount in a lot of people's minds. I don't want to give up control to some third party. Well, with a properly designed estate plan, there could be circumstances in your life where you're not able to, you know, manage your affairs temporarily or long term. For example, there could be incapacity, there could be an accident, you could be unconscious for a period of time, unable to collect money owed to you, pay bills that you owe. And by creating a, a, an estate plan, you can nominate people that you trust to carry out your wishes and have legal authority to do so. So paying your bills, collecting money that's due to you, um, you know, file lawsuits on your behalf if there was something that happened that caused you to be in that condition in the first place, right? Without that, you know, you're kind of stuck. And so there's living benefits associated with the state planning. And it's not just about um you know, distributing your assets after you're gone. Um, and don't forget, you know, this is all about thoughtfully contemplating how to provide for your loved ones, right? We always go back to minor children and, and handicapped or disabled children, et cetera, you know, because that is like our most important legacy, right? If something happens to you, how are they going to be provided for both financially and and the actual care and, and support and custody, right? So you don't want to leave those types of decisions in the hands of courts and attorneys that do not know you and do not know your family. 
and do not know what your your goals and dreams and objectives for them are. So having a thoughtfully contemplated estate plan, you know, really makes that makes that happen. So keep that in mind. Right. And, you know, another thing, you know, uh, since we've been doing this for 25 years, Greg, and going, we're going strong. Uh, a lot of our clients, you know, they've aged with us. And uh, 25 years later, we're getting the calls that uh, um, my spouse is incapacitated now. And I need to get her qualified for, you know, public benefits. Um, she, I, I need to take care of some property that she's entitled to that's in her trust. We need to do some incapacity planning. And if this client did not have their documents in place, such as the power of attorney, number one thing, there's nothing we could do. They would have to hire an attorney to get conservatorship over that spouse in order to take care of that spouse's business. That's a minimum of $5,000 just to start with. And then the fees, ongoing fees every month, every year because the estate plan and the power of attorney was not in place before the spouse became incapacitated. So if anybody's having those types of issues going on, please reach out to us so we can help you do some incapacity planning and get you in charge of the assets for that incapacitated spouse. Um, so the next myth we have, and the final myth is a do-it-yourself plan is just as effective as consulting an attorney. What do you think about these DIYs, Greg? There's a lot of them out there. Tell us a little bit more about the you pitfalls. Know, I'm a little biased, of course, so I'll admit that right up front. I do not like the DIY plan. I just don't. You know, there's there's software, there's legal document assistance, people that are not trained attorneys that have a templated document, one size fits all. I do not, I do not like those um, for the following reasons. Number one, a one size fits all plan is not that easy to customize to your specific needs and circumstances. Um, number two, if you do a DIY plan and you feel a sense of security that you've got your bases all covered, if you've made a mistake or there's un unintended consequences or tax consequences or any other consequences associated with this DIY plan you created, once you die, it's set in stone. It can't be changed. And so you might go to the great beyond thinking that you, you covered all your bases when in fact you've created more problems than you attempted to solve. Um, there are circumstances in life that you might need guidance on and help with. So Michelle just touched on a really important point. As most of us get older, you know, the percentage of people over 65 that will experience um, the need for either home care or long-term care services is dramatic. I mean, the percentage of us that are going to need some sort of services. Um, what if you're not competent at that point? You've got dementia, Alzheimer's or something. People want to do some planning to be able to hire the appropriate resources for you, uh, have access to your assets to pay for those services, to apply for public benefits to assist uh, defray the cost of those services. Without a properly designed estate plan, you're going to be more or less out of luck. You know, you're going to be in a conservatorship uh, situation, which is going to add to the cost and the fees, and again, you'll be subject to whatever the courts decide for you, as opposed to a family member that knows what you would like and and, and what your needs are are in particular. So, you know, I'm just not a big fan of the DIY plans. Think about it this way. You work a lifetime building, creating, supporting, nurturing your family, as well as accumulating whatever assets you're able to during your lifetime. And you want to trust the decision on how all of that's going to be managed and be certain in your mind that your wishes are going to be carried out with a minimum of fuss, headaches, uh, hurdles, roadblocks. You're going to trust that to yourself. Is you know, unless you're a trained professional in this area, it's like you know the old story is, 
you know, are you going to come, are you going to perform brain surgery on yourself? Or are you going to use a professional that's done it a thousand times or more? Right. So this is very important. Your estate, your family, for most of us, that's the most important things in our lives, our relationships and our family. Do we want to leave it to a DIY process to make sure that, you know, what we hope to accomplish, the legacy we hope to provide is going to be handled in an efficient, problem-free way? Or are we going to leave it to risk because once we pass, can't change whatever we've done at that point in time, right? Right. Right, right. I've seen a lot of DIYs come through here, and uh, one of my attorney friends says she loves people that do DIYs because she gets a lot of business in the probate world. She makes a lot of money, so don't don't do a DIY. Get professional help. Uh, I love our process, Greg. I just love the way you've set Ameristate up, and how easy you have made it for clients to get their estate plans done. It's not scary, people. You don't have to walk into a big fancy attorney office. We're going to get you started over the phone. Now, of course, if you're local to where we are, feel free to come into the office and meet with us and get started. But really, most people love our process because they can do it uh, over the phone, via Zoom, email. We're going to work with you, counsel with you, get your application started. We're going to make it so easy for you and stress-free. You're going to really be thankful that you got started with Ameristate. With 45,000 clients and so many great reviews, we are trusted and proven and we're affordable. We're not going to charge you thousands of dollars to get this estate plan done and we're not going to charge you by the hour i love that greg thank you so much for setting up the legal plan because it gives clients a peace of mind that they can call anytime and talk to us with simple questions they have and they're not going to get a bill in the mail because when you're calling directly to an attorney uh you're going to get about probably 250 to 500 dollar bill in the mail because they need to give you advice Give us a call. Most of your questions are going to be, you know, I'm thinking about making a change. Uh, you know, let's talk about that. We're going to get you in touch with the attorney. Everybody speaks to the attorneys. The attorney's consultations are also done over the phone or via Zoom. And then once our documents and your trust is ready to go, we're going to ship that document to the notary who's going to personally come out to see you at your home and get it signed and notarized. This is what you're going to end up getting if for those of you who do not have one of our trusts, but it's very comprehensive. It's got everything in it that you need. It includes your your uh, declaration of trust, which is about 40 pages, but really it talks about who your beneficiaries are going to be, who's going to be in charge, what your special instructions are, who's going to get what house or what car. And also you're going to get what's called a pour over will. Everybody needs a will with the trust because that will is going to be kind of like the net for the trust for things that maybe don't get titled into the into the trust or maybe are forgotten to get titled into the trust. So the will will catch it and pour it into the trust. You're going to get your powers of attorney for health, your powers of attorney for finance. We're going to prepare all the deeds that you own and, and actually record those for you as well. A lot of attorneys don't even handle that part. So I don't care where your property is in the United States. There's a few states we can't do them in. But we can handle the recording of that property as well. So just know that we're going to make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted for you. And we're not going to leave anything hanging. So that's what I love most about our process, Greg. So thank you for creating such a wonderful um, estate planning company for us to share with others in the six states that we're in, which is California, Arizona, Texas, Tennessee, Virginia, and Maryland. Okay. Um, and with that said, I wanted to uh, close a little bit before we go into the questions. 